Woo! All right, what is up, my chemistry people? Today, we are going to predict whether or not a physical or chemical process is thermodynamically favored by determination, either quantitatively or qualitatively, so using numbers or just our observations, of the signs of both delta H and delta S, and calculation or estimation of delta G when needed. All right, now let's break that down a little bit because today's lesson is definitely some things that we haven't learned about in the first year chemistry course. The first thing we're going to talk about is what the heck entropy is. Uh, we're going to define it. And then we are going to predict the sign and relative magnitude of the entropy change, delta S, uh, associated with a chemical or physical process. So after we define it, we're going to predict the sign and basically calculate what the entropy change is. Um, and then we're going to calculate delta H, delta S, and delta G and use those values to predict thermodynamic favorability. So what are those things going to tell us about whether or not uh, the reaction is going to happen spontaneously? Um, We've heard of a lot of these terms before. Delta S is probably the new one. Lucky for us, there are a lot of equations on our formula chart that will help us relate all these different things. All right, so back to the good stuff. If we think about entropy, uh, I want you to think about tossing bricks off a truck. I mean, who doesn't think about tossing bricks off a truck? Uh, but think about the two piles of bricks that you see, the one on your left, the one on your right. Which of those two is most likely gonna happen when you chuck a bunch of bricks off the back end of a truck. I mean, as nice as it would be if we could get this pile of bricks to just neatly form for us, for us uh, the reality is we're most likely going to get a pile of bricks that looks like this. In other words, disorder is far more likely than a nice organized state. Uh, likewise, as you think about sort of what's going on with this animation here at the bottom, uh, you know, a set of let's say gas particles in a container isn't going to organize itself in a nice neat little stack in one corner of the container. Uh, more probably those gas particles are going to spread out and become more disorganized uh, throughout the container than forming a nice neat stack of bricks. Now that brings us to uh, sort of one of the big concepts for today and that is understanding entropy and defining what entropy is. Well. Uh, the second law of thermodynamics states that entropy or disorder uh, of the universe is going to increase over time. But, you know, what is entropy? What does that mean? Well, entropy is essentially just a measurement of the disorder um, of a system. And that is usually given the symbol S and has the units joules, joules per Kelvin mole or mole per mole Kelvin. Now entropy, some things to keep in mind, uh, will increase with the dispersal of particles. So as those particles sort of spread out, the greater the disorder you will have. Two, as you think about entropy, the entropies of gases are larger than liquids. Liquids are going to have a greater entropy than solids, uh, which to me makes a whole lot of sense. The uh, gases are going to be more spread out, more chaotic than your liquids will, and your liquids will be more chaotic, uh, less orderly than your solids. Third thing to keep in mind as you think about entropies, uh, they are greater for more complex molecules. Uh, in other words, the bigger and more electrons that your molecule has, the more disorder that particular molecule uh, will possess, if you will, uh, as opposed to particles or molecules that have fewer electrons. Uh, entropies are greater when the number of individual particles in the same state increases. So more things are gonna create more disorder. Uh, they're gonna be greater with increased temperature. So the greater the temperature, the more kinetic energy, the more disorder. And there's also gonna be a greater amount of energy when a single gas occupies a larger volume, more space for them to spread out and to be more disordered. Fourth thing to keep in mind as you think about entropy, because the entropy of a perfect pure crystal at zero Kelvin is given a value of zero, uh, all absolute entropies for individual substances above zero Kelvin, i.e. in the real world, are positive. Uh, so again, zero Kelvin, absolute zero, all molecular motion stops in theory. Uh, so that would be the instance in which we have zero entropy or everything is completely ordered. Uh, so in our world, everything is in motion uh, and therefore it will have some positive entropy value. 
The fifth thing to keep in mind about entropy is that the entropy change for a system uh, or a reaction is calculated from the absolute entropies of the products and reactants. Hopefully this formula looks familiar. It's exactly the same uh, as the change in enthalpy uh, is calculated. It's the entropy of your products minus the sum of the entropy of your reactants. Keep in mind if your delta S is negative, then that implies a decrease in entropy or a decrease in disorder, which is not favored. Again, the universe favors disorder, this favors crazy, favors chaos. Uh, so we're looking for positive delta S's uh, that indicate an increase of entropy, an increase of disorder. Which brings us to the second big topic for today, which is Gibbs free energy. Um, now, a couple things here. Standard free energy of formation is the free energy change when one mole of a substance forms from its elements in their standard state under standard conditions. Uh, we're given the symbol there of delta G sub F. Uh, keep in mind, just like enthalpy changes, the Gibbs free energy changes of formation for elements have zero values of zero, since forming an element from itself results in no change. As you think about Gibbs free energy, some things to keep in mind, we're provided with an equation on your formula chart, which will help us calculate the Gibbs free energy change for a reaction. Again, simply by looking at the Gibbs free energy changes of the products and the Gibbs free energy change of the reactants, summing those individual parts together and then subtracting the sum of the Gibbs free energy change of the reactants from the Gibbs free energy of the products will give you the overall Gibbs free energy change. If you calculate that change to be greater than zero, then we are implying a non-thermodynamically favored uh, reaction to put energy into the reaction in order for it to occur. Indicated here by this friendly gentleman on the right hand side of your screen, you've got to put energy in in order to get that reaction to proceed. Conversely, if you've got a Gibbs free energy change that is calculated to be less than zero, then we uh, understand the reaction to be thermodynamically favored, that no outside source of energy it needs to be added, uh, that we are going to form those products readily. As we see here on the left, negative Gibbs free energy change, that will happen unaided, spontaneously, or will be thermodynamically favored. Uh, however, if you calculate a Gibbs free energy change that is equal to zero, uh, it implies that the reaction is e at equilibrium where neither reactant nor product formation uh, is favored. And basically our understanding of Gibbs free energy is simply the energy um, in a reaction that can be used for work, that can make stuff happen. And ultimately, as provided on your formula chart, we have a relationship between all of these quantities. Uh, again, we are thinking about the enthalpy change, delta H, and the entropy change, uh, delta S, and what that tells us in terms of whether or not the reaction will proceed. And you're given a table format um, of the signs of those things and what it means in terms of thermodynamic favorability. But I like to think of it in terms of this, uh, sort of coordinate plane here, where uh, if you have entropy on your uh, y-axis and enthalpy on your x-axis, uh, generally speaking then, uh, your favorable conditions are when you have positive, um, positive entropy change or positive delta S and negative enthalpy change or negative delta H. And so anytime you have both of those very favorable conditions, your delta G is always going to be negative. And again, as you think about this equation, which relates those variables, again, when this is going to be negative and you subtract from it uh, something that's positive, you're going to get something that's always going to be negative and therefore always thermodynamically favored or spontaneous. Conversely, if you've got a positive delta H and a negative uh, delta S value, uh, subtracted a negative, you're always going to have a positive delta G. So always uh, going to be non-thermodynamically favored or non-spontaneous. Where we run into problems then is where we've got uh, one of these variables that is thermodynamically favored and one that is not. Um, and that will then be dependent upon the temperature. And so as you look at this, again, coordinate plane, if you've got a positive delta H 
and a positive delta S. So one of those not thermodynamically favored, one is thermodynamically favored, uh, you will get a thermodynamically favored reaction or you will get a spontaneous reaction when the temperature is high. Conversely, uh, if you've got a negative delta S, which implies not thermodynamically favored, but a negative delta H, which implies something that is thermodynamically favored, uh, that will be spontaneous or will be thermodynamically favored, but only at low temperatures. So I think that putting these in this sort of coordinate plane sort of helps you recognize what things will be thermodynamically favored, what will not, uh, just thinking about where they're at in that uh, coordinate plane. Um, some last things to think about here, uh, thermodynamically favored reactions may still not occur um, at any measurable rate if they have what's called a very high activation energy. Um, and again, we'll talk more about this when we get to the kinetics unit, but basically we'll say that it's under kinetic control, um, even if it's thermodynamically favored. There are some other things we need to sort of think about. Second thing to sort of think about here with Gibbs free energy change is that uh, reactions that are not thermodynamically favored can be forced to proceed by applying that external source of energy. Again, a really great example is to go back to our electrochemistry unit. Think about uh, those rechargeable batteries, um, forcing that reaction to proceed um, by inputting some source of energy there. And then lastly, as you think about Gibbs free energy, uh, you can also combine thermodynamically unfavored reactions with a thermodynamically favored reaction via what are called their common intermediates. And we'll talk more about that in the next unit. Um, but that can lead to an overall favorable thermodynamic process. And that is known as coupling.